Hi everyone. We're uh, we're just getting we're just getting settled. We're going to wait a few minutes before we get. We're going to wait a minute or two before we get started. Um, thanks all for for joining us today. So much of the country is having um, fantastic weather. So I hope wherever you all are, you're enjoying this uh, kind of the, the, the last piece of, um, of our fall. All right, well, welcome everyone to this week's On the Park Bench, a public square conversation. Um, today, we're really excited to have Andrea Strawani talking about the post-pandemic community. Will new urbanists find itself in the trash heap of history and what can we do about it? So um, Andreas did a very similar talk to NTBA in July and I asked him to update it um, for, for, for us. On the Park Bench is a webinar series that we created uh, when the pandemic started to create a way for CNU members to engage uh, with each other um, and to have conversations and debate. So, we uh, strongly encourage everyone to send in questions, particularly on today's talk, because Andreas is nothing if not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Nothing if not controversial at times. Um, additionally, we're finishing up our fall member drive. Um, if you were trying to join last week and were unable to, we had a um, we had a problem with uh, our online payment system. Becoming a member is a way to support programs like this for On the Park Bench, programs like the our public square, Rob Studeville. So uh, if you haven't joined or renewed, please do. You can do it online at members.cnu.org. And um, also know that we have a couple of new upcoming webinars. Diru Tadani wanted to launch an author's forum. Um, so once a month for the next 12 months, we are setting aside time for um, authors to talk about their new books, what they learned, what it means. So next week is Architecture and the City. Um, with author Michael Dennis and interviewer with Dan Solomon. Um, in December, it will be Space and Anti-Space, The Fabric of Place, City, and Architecture um, with authors Barbara Littenberg and Steve Peterson and interviewer Philip Langdon. So uh, we, have, we have these next uh, 12 of these uh, planned out by Diru. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lou Marquette to help introduce today's seminar. Again, I'm going to stay on to keep prodding um, Andreas with questions, as is Lou. And, I'm, and I encourage everyone to send in their questions and comments on the Q&A button. So Lou, take it away. Well, I would bet that a lot of people who are on today, welcome, uh, are familiar with Andreas, his work, and his presentations, which are the advancement of his thinking on different topics at different times. And that's what we at the National Town Builders Association have really enjoyed about Andreas, because he tosses us to think about things from a completely different perspective in ways that a lot of us would not conceive. He's written books, he's designed some of the best places around. There's nobody that any of us know that's thought about this subject more than he has. So we respect his thoughts even when they take us sometimes out to left field and we have to find our way back. But therein is information that we all value. So with that, Andreas, thank you for coming and speaking to us today. We can't hear you yet. Yeah, can you hear me now? There you go, got you now. Okay, yep. Great, great. It's all yours. Okay, now I would like to begin with something that a little bit of wisdom that Liz dropped last night, late in the evening. Uh, most unexpected, you know, she's been teaching uh, climate change adaptation for uh, seven years at the University of Miami. Uh, and uh, one of the things she's concluded is that the one universal uh, form of adaptation is you move away from trouble. Yeah, you move away from trouble. And there's a lot to be said for that and something that we need to engage as new urbanists as people move away from the floods and the fires, where are they going to land? And that's another agenda that is of tremendous interest that Lynn and I have been speaking about, the receiving cities or the welcoming cities and so forth. But she said one thing last night. She said, 
unlike climate, the consequences of climate change, this is like wartime, you can't escape. You know, uh, COVID, you can't escape. You live in fear at any time that somebody is gonna knock on the door with a submachine gun and get you. And by the way, I just, uh, I just read my alumni magazine and for the first time three, most of my classmates aren't dying yet, but three died uh, this month, uh, you know, of COVID. Uh, so you can't escape. And so people will do, people, it's the consequences I think are enormous. And here are some of the things, I wrote these notes a long time ago, it's a real old piece of paper, but look at what I thought was happening already, okay, that what we have against us. Now, I'm not saying, I, I put this out in the sense that we have to develop responses, okay? I know the minute I mention something, you say, well, there's a response to that, but this is what people are thinking now. So what, what is it that we propose that is in jeopardy? First of all, density, okay, density, Crowd, it's obviously there's a difference between density and crowding, but people think density is bad and they're moving out like mad into the suburbs and you can't deny that. Uh, transit is in jeopardy, tremendous jeopardy because you have to sit with other people. By the way, that also goes with uh, Uber, like the salvation of Uber isn't really going to work because who sat in front of your car? Who sat on that seat before you did? Okay, then the whole idea of open communities, the fact that uh, anybody can walk in any time, which is our ideal. You know, that's very much into question now, uh, not only because of the, the fact that the stranger is dangerous for disease, it could be that if there's a social breakdown, the stranger is dangerous until proven otherwise, which is a prior condition in civilization, which may be recurring. And so our open communities, you can't just talk about these things in a lecture and assume that people are for them because these sound sometimes insane. Okay, then there's face-to-face -face retail. Our lovely uh, our lovely face-to-face -face retail in which we get to know the storefront and we walk down the crowded streets every day. You know, Jane Jacobs Festival of the Sidewalk, you know, all that, yeah. You know, be careful. You might sound like an insane person. Uh, the social third places, you know, let's hang around over beer, let's hang around over coffee. That's intrinsically into question. Uh, the effective governance has been put into question, not just because Trump's incompetent, but I think that uh, there's gonna be a withdrawal of the capability of government to deal with things and, th and government's gonna become a lot more local, okay? And I th I'm afraid that many of our ideas, uh, too many of our ideas are dependent upon money coming from the feds. You know, it always makes my teeth hurt when people just say, well, this is what you, how you do affordable housing, this is how you do this is how you sort of keep the tides and the fires away. What makes you think that we're not broke? You know, and, and I think we have the, 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 a lot of the premise of the new urbanism is that government's going to help us. And I don't think they are. And then, of course, there's community engagement. For God's sake, community engagement. Bring on the hundreds of people to tell us what they want. So that format of the charrette, you know, needs to also be rethought. I do think that many of us have, have responses to this, we're formulating responses, mostly verbal, and mostly they're negative, we're on the defensive. I would like to propose that all of this is extremely stimulating. And if we address this the way new urbanists have a tendency to do, with not just policy and not just numbers and words, but also with design, that we can turn it around and make communities that make more sense that are more resilient, they make more sense, and they're more pleasant than ever to live in. And I just wanna bring in a little thing, just one little thing. As you know, uh, what sunlight and fresh air are, um, you know, are one of the things that keep you healthy, and the sunlight actually uh, is very, very uh, uh, protects you, it's prophylactic, you know, vitamin D. And I've always assumed that since I'm such a good guy and such a sensible architect, that my houses are full of sunlight and air. Okay, my dwellings are full and my patios and my gardens are full of sun, sunlight and air. When I started thinking about sunlight and breezes, you know what? I hadn't given the damn thing a thought for a long time. We just assume that if you do traditional urbanism and if you do porches and if you do, you know, windows that are, you know, vertical and so forth. So that, that, you know, but we have not taken that seriously. And I mean, seriously in the sense of being drivers of design, okay? And, that's, and that has been for me a revelation. 
how I actually, we haven't been paying attention to that. And then there's one other thing too, which is, you know, we're very community oriented. And of course there's the house, which is a private community. And then there's the neighborhood, which is our next level of community. And then, you know, sometimes we think about the city as the next level of community and then the region. There's a level of community that's missing, which is the compound, okay, in which people can assemble, not just between the dwelling and the neighborhood, there's an assemblage, a complex assemblage of dwellings and, and, and working and support, you know, which actually used to be extremely common in the world throughout history. From the palazzos of Italy of the Renaissance to the ranchos of the West, to the first buildings, all the buildings that you see in, in Williamsburg, for example, they're all compounds. And people lived in complex arrangements. And that's a building type. You know, we've been harping on about the missing middle, the missing middle for God's sake for 10 years. Okay, we get it. I mean, the missing middle we've known, all we've done is name something that already occurred, okay? That is nothing new, the missing middle. And it actually, our harping on it actually shows you that we are, we, we lack for ideas because what we need is another missing middle and it's the missing middle that's administrative. You know, like what is actually that level that allows me, for example, to start a one room schoolhouse, which is, you know, the bubble, it's a terrible name, but that's what's being used now. A lot of people are actually beginning to teach not only their kids at home, but actually their kids among other dwellings, three or four people getting together and saying, hey, we're gonna build a one room schoolhouse or we're gonna build, for example, an outdoor meeting area under a roof because we can't bring people to the house, you know, because it's dangerous, but we're gonna meet out there in the breeze under a porch, or we're gonna, we're gonna build a playground. Well, you know what? I don't wanna to go to Coral Gable City Hall to build a shared shelter among my neighbors, just in my block. We got the space, but do I really have to change the code of Coral Gables or can we have another increment which is perhaps a cluster. So you see what I think we need to introduce is we have the dwelling, but we need a compound of dwellings. And then we need a cluster of compounds because we need to act in the absence of government or in the within the realm of the recalcitrance of governments. And that has physical implications that are pretty wonderful. So we're not just laying out blocks 200 by 700. You know, we have blocks and then we have a neighborhood center. That, you know, and then we wiggle the streets because we're very skillful designers. You know, that's all form. What we need is a fundamental rethinking of the relationship between the physical urbanism and the level of governance. And we need to introduce additional levels, especially as the upper levels collapse. Those are the things that we're thinking about. And by the way, none of them are punitive. See, the responses that I'm looking for are not the ones that say, oh, thou, shall, thou sinner, you deserve your punishment. Not at all. That doesn't sell real estate. Oh, there's a very small market segment that loves to suffer. And it's mostly not American. It's people who used to be Protestants in Northern Europe seem to actually want to live in such places. Americans don't. You know, it's got to make sense. It's got to be a good investment. And above all, it's got to be fun. And one more thing that I want to say, because I always keep track of people who oppose us. I do not think that it's modernism that opposes us. I do not think it's even landscape urbanism that opposes us. You know who our principal opponent is? Margaritaville. Okay, Margaritaville, and if you don't know, you should find out about it, are communities that are dedicated to fun based on the song Margaritaville. And they're all over Florida. They're spreading like McDonald's. There's one in Daytona that sells 45 houses a week, 45 houses. So what did I do? I called up the guy, you know, and I said, you low class bastard, you're not even making enough money. You know, if you're selling to the lower middle class, can we up it a bit and then lower it a bit? You know, let's hit other ma market segments with this idea that people like to have fun. But in the end, he's an opponent. Okay, in the end, we, we're having a whole new realm of people, including a, an emerging social irresponsibility that we have to engage front on and actually find out, not just say, hey, they're dumb, oh, what a bunch of irresponsible people, but why are they selling 45 a week, you know, just two hours drive from where I am? 
Okay, that's, that's extremely interesting. And that's also part of our problem. We have opponents, we have things that oppose us that are new and different, okay? And so, so I wanna bring that up. Um, then there's the internal space of the dwelling. I just had an insight this morning. You know, when, when, you, when you have to isolate, when you quarantine yourself, I just, there's an article in the Times today about quarantine. I hadn't realized, I thought that only sick people are quarantined. Did you have a relative, you put them off somewhere, you know, basically you'd be ill for three, four weeks or a month. No, quarantine is you get locked up in your room if you've been, if you think you've been with somebody that catches the COVID. It's extremely common. I didn't realize, like if you come home from school, Lou, and you say, hey, I just had a meeting with somebody and he got COVID two days later, you have to quarantine yourself. And that has implications you know, that are different from the sick person. It's people have to isolate. And I'm getting to know more and more about that. People that are perfectly not sick, but have to be put off and be alone for two weeks. So that's interesting. And that affects that the dwelling, no less than the compound and no less than working at home. So to bring up one other thing, as I walk around my neighborhood and I'm in a very well-behaved neighborhood, um, the most successful conversions to workplace are the garages. And I have photographs that I think I've shown you. People that have nice garages up in the front, they open the doors and there are their desks. And there's, you know, it isn't just junk storage. It's actually the most interesting room in the house. The garage is a loft, much better as a future workplace then let us say a, uh, you know, converting your living room, which is what I've done. I've really crumbed up my living room with this stuff with big screens. You know, this would be much better if I had a decent garage. So the garage is loft. Now, what does that do to new urbanism? It turns the house around, completely around in the garage, which is the anti-social space, which we always put in the back. The garage is death to the pedestrian. The garage now is life to the pedestrian, life. And by the way, the driveway is a plaza. Where do we meet here in Coral Gables? People have wide driveways. We pull out our seats and that's where we sit. So all this stuff that we put in the back, we have to rethink and say, well, maybe it should be in the front. Particularly the, as the cars disappear, we need to design garages as if they were future lofts. Now, the amount of stuff that this dislodges in terms of new urbanism is astonishing. We can't just talk about density. We can't just talk about completely open communities. We can't just talk about garages in the back because you know what, I've tried it. Well, I stopped myself before I did in public presentations because I found that I would sound like a murderer. Yeah, you all come to my third place now. You know, let's just have a beer. Let's have crowded sidewalks. We cannot make the old presentation. And I do think the new urbanism is in for a big change. One last little thing about this. The main response that I get when I say this is, is that this will be over soon and we'll go right back to where we were. This will be over soon. And by the way, there are consultants that say that this will not be over. The pandemic of 1918 was not over. Okay, it was not over. It persisted and it changed, it changed architecture drastically. Modern architecture, I can document this, came in on the pandemic, on the wings of the pandemic, modern architecture, the disappearance of the porch, the emergence of the terrace, the roof garden, the great glazed wall, the double height space that allowed light to go deep into the house, the washable walls in white, okay? That, was, that made a permanent effect. It wasn't that neurosis of the First World War that changed things. It was the pandemic of 1918. And one other thing, people move south 20 and 30 years before air conditioning. People say, oh yeah, well, the Sun Belt opened up when air conditioning came in. No, it didn't. It opened up in the 20s, in 1920. People move from San Francisco to LA. People move from New York to Florida, didn't open up in 1945. It opened up in 1920, before air conditioning. And what they were looking for is sun and fresh air and outdoors. And that was permanent. That was permanent, that was a permanent change. So what we do now, instead of dismissing it and thinking this is gonna go away, this is not gonna go away. And it's gonna be good for us if we address it with a good spirit of creativity. Anyway, that's the wrap.
Hey, Andreas, one oh. quick question before, uh, before Lou comes in. Talk to me about timeline. I hear exactly what you're saying about garages uh, being the kind of lifeblood now to the public realm. Um, but at the same time, we're talking about this period of time. Is it this year? Is it next year? Maybe it's another two or three years. You know, there, there's, there's short and long-term and medium-term changes. Have you thought about the, these, these characteristics, these changes, these, these threats across the timeline? Um, I have thought about a lot about this in terms of climate change. And as you know, we met in Sacramento and I actually had dates. I'd say by this time and by that time, you know, people will lose hope and we have to have an answer. Not about the pandemic yet. No, I haven't actually. I have not thought about it. But I am thinking about the kids. The uh, generation uh, Z is 20 years old and um, it's fascinating because I know a couple of people that have uh, kids like that. And they're, um, I think they're potential activists. You know this thing about direct action that instead of lobbying elected officials, these kids are just acting directly. Okay, for example, Greta, Greta Thunberg, she's old style. She wants the United Nations to change things, okay? What the kids are doing, according to Robert Orr and um, Irina Wolf, who have a very young uh, eight, uh, 20 year olds, they're just taking direct action and creating their own communities with their own currency, okay? They're just bypassing, they're, <laughs> they're bypassing Airbnb. They're just, it's amazing what's going on. Like they have, they're, they're just, Robert talks about it and says, it is absolutely awesome. The old corporations and the old developers can't possibly keep up with their agility, okay? So what I'm looking at now is not so much the timeline as the generations, because mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a bunch of people like for example, Matt Lambert, you know, my youngest partner, he's definitely deep into the family formation in the house, you know, and all that. But the young kids are gorillas, much, much, much closer to lean urbanism and tactical urbanism, uh, but electronically induced. And I'm beginning and I think to watch quite a bit they don't they don't they're not attached to things they uh -huh. don't need many things yeah as long as it's uh, speaks to them they're yeah. they're fine let's go you know yeah they do and right. they trade and so forth yeah so so they're they're really mobile and uh they live in the most complex arrangements robert was describing to me how they live in new haven 15 kids and how they're living you know, and how they exchange with the Italian kids and so forth, totally bypassing the capitalist system that we know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's bypassing everything. Andreas, so, there's, there's a lot of questions coming in mm -hmm. as a reaction to your statements about modernism coming in on the tail of the pandemic of 1918. Yeah. And I think that what I read in these a little bit is people are asking, how's it gonna change this time? Since you're out on the tip of the surfboard for the rest of us, what are you seeing as a way that it's going to morph this urbanist thinking that we've had to be not in the wake of it, but on the in the lead of it? Well, yeah. you know, this began when I began to to look at uh, the modernist buildings, particularly in uh, in the ones that went south. You right. know the. And uh, the houses were called health houses, health houses, you know? And so I was thinking, uh, so they, obviously these guys were modernists because they wanted to be modernists, okay? And so what they did is they hooked onto something and said, oh, we're gonna tie this, for, this cart to the pandemic of light, air, cross ventilation, white surfaces. By the way, even the metal furniture, you know, you know this metal furniture? With the with the leather straps, it didn't have cooties like uh, like uh, stuffed furniture. Right. You know, right. it was like it was sold that way. This is healthy, and so the way I'm looking at it, I don't know. Well, I certainly think that modernism has a few things to teach us. First of all, I the terrace. The terrace is not a porch. It's but it's a definite. It's a frontage that we don't use. Okay, but for example, the driveway is a terrace, it's not a porch. But if you think of it as a terrace, it totally transforms. Mm -hmm. 
and it might have to do with, with surfacing. It might have to do with actually making it level. It might have to do, it's the budgets there. Don't call it a drive, but call it a terrace, for example. That's one thing. Uh, I'm also fascinated by the roof gardens. You know this, why do we want pitch roofs? Why are new urbanists obsessed by pitch roofs? Well, the market loves them, I got it. But now it's become a religious icon, religious, quasi-religious, like we don't allow it in any of the codes of the new urbanism. Well, guess what? The roof garden is a fantastic place of extraordinary flexibility, you know, um, and transformability as well, you know? And I'm very, I'm fascinated by the roof garden and the possibility. Okay, and there's one more thing. You remember the piloti we hate, the piloti in which the buildings are raised off the ground, the Corbusier introduced, and how much we hate buildings that are raised off the ground because they don't have a frontage, you know, like, the HUD building in Washington. We hate that stuff, right? Because it's not a proper frontage, the PLOT. Well, Arquitectonica just finished a dorm at the University of Miami. Uh, and a dorm, you know, dorms these days are recruiting instruments. And what they did is they raised the building three stories. So instead of the, of the underneath being a completely dark, lousy, you know, rotten place, the way we, they always have been, they've become incredibly airy logias. Like the kids are sitting underneath these, these, these quite large buildings, but with 36 and 40 foot clearance, magnificent spaces with sunlight and breezes going by and the landscaping coming in. So, you know, the, most new urbans would say, hey, that's not one of our eight frontages. We don't do that. That's not one of our eight frontages. And by the way, we hate piloti. And then there's the transformation of the piloti. And what is the urbanism that corresponds to the raised building? Like what happens when the buildings are raised three, three stories? Do the streets go underneath? What happens in the third, you know, what I'm saying is that there's a, a lot of stimulating stuff that we haven't engaged and we need the DNA. We needed the DNA anyway, okay? Thank God for COVID, to, you know, sort of knock some DNA into us. So, so how do we work through the density that I think a lot of us consider as a demand for these young people to be together, to be close, to be interactive, and therein you create, you know, either density or crowding. How does that? How do you, how do we work with that? Mm -hmm. Is it underneath the piloti or? No, uh, well, we have several answers. Uh, one of them is uh, there is the separation of the road from, you can do, I can hit 40 units of the acre, single story, okay? As long as the cars don't have to park on the lot. What happens is that the car is a monster. In its, in its need for maneuvering and parking and backing up, it eats up a huge amount of space. If you, keep the car at the edge of the block, you can actually do a carpet. And that carpet will give you housing that's one story at 40 units of the acre with a yard, okay? So now if we think that density is four stories, well, we're not in the same world anymore. I think density has to be achieved. You know what we have to do? I'm sorry to say this, but it's actually, I love the idea. When was the last time we designed a single story city? A one story city? that's dense and mixed use. Because you know, many of the places that we love in old cities, the five points shops, the shops that are called some often five points in Southern cities and so forth. There's some in Atlanta, Lincoln Road, they were one story. What makes us think that mixed use has to be on top? Why can't it be behind or beside? You see what I'm saying? It's stuff like that is not our, it's not our doctrine, but we have to look at it. And the way to look at it is not, hey, we need that look of the four story. No, we don't need the look. What we need is the density and the sociability, not the look. We're not in it for the look. And too much of the new urbanism has become for the look. Well, in fact, what, we're, what we wanna do, for example, mobile homes. As you know, I had an incredible uh, two years ride learning about mobile home communities. They're more sociable than any new urbanist community I have ever seen, and people know each other more. They break every rule of new urbanism. They have a staggered frontage. They don't define space. 
what we need to I have analyzed. We I have to analyze why they're more sociable. What is it that they do that makes them more sociable? You know, and this is what I learned. I can give you a very short answer. They don't have a backyard, which is where Americans go. They only have a side yard. And the side yard, which doesn't even have a porch very often, is actually facing the street on a diagonal angle. It's an almost exact, so no one can ever hide in the backyard. Everybody is in full sociable mode at any time. And the other thing is, because actually the maintenance is not, is not individual, the maintenance is uh, all the grass is mowed by a single person, there are no fences. There are no fences. Do you realize the power of a fence, by the way, which you know, new urbanism is absolutely based on, on those picket fences, right? Well, what about no fence? What about no delineation of where your lot begins and ends? Well, guess what? That is 100% against new urbanist pr practice. It's 100% against uh, Newman. It's 100% against the work of UDA you know, that actually fixed the, the, the housing meltdown of HUD by adding fences. And now I'm saying, well, within certain socioeconomic conditions, fences are mortal to sociability. They keep you away from each other. You can't filter, you can't see, you feel like you're alien. You can't come without phoning ahead of time. You can't wander through. And there's stuff like that. It's about five things I've learned from mobile home parks that deliver sociability at a very low cost. Very low cost. So what I want you, us to do is to, is to actually get off the aesthetic of the new urbanism and start looking at the intention of the new urbanism. Mm -hmm. Our intention is sociability. It's not porches. Porches were an instrument and they're actually falling and they're expensive. Anyway, that kind of thing. Well, you've hit on this one about new buildings. Let's see, rewatching the design. What is the what is the future for for a market of, of of ideas about public space? I mean, being associated with public space, do you think that is going to be mm -hmm. less important to be interconnected with it as opposed to going to it? To the project. Okay, so last January, I made a final presentation for a very interesting park in uh, in Vero Beach that actually was programmed to be a town center. It was a park, but it got fully programmed, mixed use, et cetera. I was, it was finished and I was paid, okay? And when I was about to present the usual drill of you know festivals and sociability, I sounded insane to myself. I couldn't present it. And I had to completely redesign it. And this is the program of the town center, which you see there, do you see it? Yes. Okay, first of all, the shops are open are open pavilions, okay? And they're available not only, they're like open markets, they're not always open. They can also be used, by the way, for schooling. Do you realize how symbiotic that is? When the school's open, you're not shopping. So why not use the classrooms and then bring in the groceries at night? So that's the idea of these open buildings there. By the way, the parking is brought into the back of them so that the trucks can come in very quickly deliver the groceries, okay? So we actually bring uh, parts in. See, the, see these little houses here? That's an X hotel. I had a hotel there. Okay, that hotel, of course, nobody, the hotels are dead. Who wants to share air conditioning? Who wants to share an elevator? Nobody wants to share that stuff. So we took them apart into the old Florida cottages, okay, with your own parking in the net. Do you see the building number two? That's a conference center. Why is it thin? because all the conference centers are dead because they're all air conditioned. No one goes to a conference center or a convention center. You might as well send them to a concentration camp. You probably last longer in a concentration camp. You know, they make you sick. So we did one that's cross ventilated, right? Thin and cross ventilated. And then we did uh, uh, restaurants, 16 here. Those two are restaurants that actually don't have any internal space to speak of. And uh, they're actually places to sit in case of rain, uh, but they're they're both roofed and outdoors, and actually the it, it they're they're fed by trucks. But here's the main thing: Do you see how the trees are gridded? Okay, around there, that's a 20 foot grid. That's for that's for families sitting on blankets 
watching their kids at the pool. That pool is only for kids. Okay, it's only two feet deep. It's for the little children who don't infect each other. Actually, they don't get sick. So you don't put adults in pools. You got to close down the pools. But the little kids can actually be there. And the families can actually sit in the grid of trees. And the spacing, what we did all over this plan, all the social spacing is done by landscaping. Over here at 26, that is a grid of palm trees and shade trees at a 10 foot center, <clears throat> which is exactly what a table is. You can move the table all you want. You can do whatever you want on a table, but 10 foot keeps you apart perfectly. Okay. And it's just, it's landscaping that was on the budget anyway. Now go down here, for example, do you see the 36 and those little, uh, that's an outdoor auditorium, an outdoor auditorium and museum. Do you know what the little bits are? These little things there, they're picnic tables. There are picnic tables that sit six. The picnic table means that your social group faces inward and you can't move them. You know, you're basically self-administered, self-administering your bubble. You're not sitting, you know, facing every which way in anything. So the picnic table, the American picnic table becomes something extraordinary. 20, 34 is an art school. Do you see the art school there? Those are, that's housing for teachers in the front and then basic studios in the back, you know, studios for piano and, and dance, et cetera, in the back, but it's not a building. Everything's open air. And over here at 35, those are apartment buildings that are because of the checkerboard pattern, which is anti-new urbanist, you know, the parking is in front and the back. Every single unit is a corner unit full of sunlight and cross ventilation, no hallways. Okay, there's stuff like that. This is full of that kind of thing. This happens to me in the water. By the way, sailing is one of the healthiest things you can do. You know, if you're, uh, if you're a child, as far as the sport's concerned, and then, and then sand volleyball. But anyway, this, is a, this, this has the full program of a town center. It's got the hotel, it's got the shops, it's got the restaurants, it's got the civic, it's got everything. But look at what it looks like. It looks completely different than a new urbanist scheme. And it doesn't look like landscape urbanism either. It's much more geometric, you see? And I did this because I had to actually present this without sounding like a murderer. It, this had to be invented so that it would go ahead. By the way, the, of course, the, tr the, the Trump voters hated it because they don't think it's real. That they thought it was, I really got in trouble from the right wing. Let me show you two renderings of this next. This is all, this is all uh, just, uh, okay, that's from the air. There's plenty of spatial, no, go, go back one. There, there's plenty of spatial definition. It's just not the way we normally think about it as new urbanists. Okay, but all the spaces are designed. Next, okay. Okay, that's the open, that's the open market. That could also be a classroom. This one is actually attached to an air conditioned, uh, administration building, but they're mostly open sheds. And really what I envision here is schools, open air schools. That's an open air school during the school day. And then the trucks come in at night, you know, the decentralized shops, the only people that can overcome Amazon come in with their fruit and their goods and they sell it outdoors. Next, is there another? Okay, these are the open air restaurants. Next. And this is, a, this is an open air uh, church for weddings and meeting halls. It all opens up on the sides. Basically the, the sea breezes come in and clean it out. Um, it's also a place, by the way, when you make an outdoor, an outdoor space and it rains, you always need to have a lot of roof for people to, to, to go in in case of rain and then come out again. Okay, so all this roofy stuff is there also to, to take the people. I grew up in, uh, in, 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 with outdoor cinemas in Spain and there was a bar that had a roof and when it rained, it was great. Everybody crowded into the, into the, into the open air bar. It was fun. So that's, see, that's, that's, that has the same social intention as new urbanism and it has nothing to do formally with new urbanism, but it has everything to do with COVID. So take this idea, Andreas, and now consider applying it to the suburbs around all these cities in America where everybody feels the suburbs are a refuge to get out of the city, but when they get there, there's nothing there but sprawl. How do we bring these ideas as a solution 
to the socialization mm-hmm. community of sprawl? Is there a way to push well, this stuff in and still have it be open air? Again, well, you've got to reflect a little bit on the North. Give us a hint of what mm-hmm. happens in the North of America. You know? I have to answer that later. Okay. okay. Because you guys might be totally screwed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and it's because of the 24 hours. In Florida, we have 24 hour warm enough weather, you know, and that's, that's what gets me. But I'll say there's a lot of archaic stuff lying around. You know, we've already identified the, uh, we've identified the dead, the dead uh, uh, shopping malls, the dead shopping centers. We know about that already, the gray fields. You know, the, our schools are idiotic. Our high schools are completely idiotic. Okay, you know, what do you mean 1300 kids in high school with football fields and soccer fields and all this stuff? You know, this could fit, a new town center could fit, it could fit in the local high school uh, playing fields, for as an example. If the, if the high school becomes archaic, because it's a super spreader, right? And these kids are old enough to get, to, to get very diseased. You know, the super high school. We might have to go back to little high schools, something much closer than, a, than by the way, you know, most prep schools, for God's sake, are 350 students. Why does a high school have to be, and they're made out of separate buildings. The kids walk outside all the time. They have campuses. Why does a high school have to be a mega structure for 1,500 kids at the time or 2,000? Well, why don't we take those fields and turn them into town centers of this kind? I think it's quite possible to do it. Now. Remember, look at what I'm doing. I'm, I'm getting away from the present. I know this sounds insane, but for me, the present is a distortion field. I don't, the pre, I don't like to think about the present. I like to think, well, what happens uh, if things go very wrong and how can we pull off great things precisely because things have gone wrong? And also because we have so many idiotic typologies. Yeah, this could go on a high school playing field. You made a statement earlier today about people retiring and having a difficult time of it. And so what's the way that we react to this Margaret Vederville, less expensive, full socialization chaos? Okay. okay. Uh, the problem with Margaritaville is that it's, it's pretty low end fun. If you've been, it's like a frat house. Okay. Right, right. It's, it's a frat house with older folk. There is something else there, there's a whole bunch of other people whose best times were college, okay? Not the frat house, but actually the college, the sociability of college. So I designed this place as a retirement community and it's based actually in a college quadrangle. And what you're seeing is L-shaped units with outdoor yards, each one with a bedroom, okay? And very inexpensive. So these are people that actually don't have much money. They just have their retirement. They have $6,000 a month. That's all they have. They don't have any savings, but they can pay the freight on this. And so they live on this, you know, on these L-shaped units. And then there's two big structures. One is a big hall for, uh, for dining and entertainment and dancing. And the other one is one that can be cut up into buildings so they can form their own associations. This I learned from the villages. And then there's an administrative building that also has medical in it. This can grow, by the way, the fundamental dimension for all our work is 200 feet. And the reason is that that's the size of the American block, okay? If you design something that fits in 200 feet, then it can be either, it can work in the suburbs and green fields, but it automatically works on an urban block. So you can see where the two streets are. And this can grow, I don't have it here, but this can actually densify in the other direction. So one of the things to answer is, I think we can design Greenfield and, 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 and infill very well, just keep, just, just keep tracking that 200 foot dimension. This is killer density, it's very cheap to build, and it's for retirement people that are not actually party goers. And you can, you can so, because and by the way, the biggest disease people have is isolation. This is an isolation breaker. Okay, this just busts up your isolation. You can't, and I could go into detail as to how it's sociologically designed so that people meet and can't avoid each other and then can also avoid each other. But that's what we're doing for, the, for that market. We've also designed a, a, a very, very chic um, um, uh, homeless, homeless shelter. Can you show that? I'll show it to you. And the reason, by the way, the reason I designed that homeless shelter is no matter how small the mobile home I designed, 
and I told him it wasn't a homeless shelter, I was part of the problem. Okay, so no, go back, go back. Okay, so that everything's down to the last nail, it's $3,000 in materials, okay, on it. Next, it's built out of plywood, which is the miracle material, next. So the plywood is cut, straight cut, doesn't need a CNC cutter, 35 sheets of plywood, solid as a rock, next. Okay, the floor plan is, it's got a bed, a bench, a desk, everything, tons of storage, next. It's eight by eight by eight. It opens up, as you can see, because a lot of these people hang around outside. They also have an enormous amount of storage. Okay, so there's an indoor living area and then an outdoor hanging out area. The thing opens up like a clamshell, next. Next. It's built step-by-step. Step. The first one's been built in Atlanta now. It's just cut plywood and step-by-step step it's built there. Next, like that, and then up, like that. Okay, get it? And it's just one material. The materials list is nothing. It's really remarkable. Next. And this is what it looks like when it's shut. By the way, it's covered with Ames pool paint, which is this wonderful rubberized paint <laughs> that seals everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's where that whole concept of putting that stuff on a screen to make a boat came from, right? Right, right. So Ames pool paint is a miracle material. <laughs> no flashing, no roofing, no paint. It's fantastic. Oh and way, if it leaks, you just give somebody a little can of it with a paintbrush. Right. Right. There's a lot of sociology built into this. By the way, this isn't for the totally decrepit people, but but it is incredibly much nicer. And it's also cute enough to not be a, a, a you know, a, an eyesore. Next, any, any inside? You see, you see the sides of it? And now out there is going to be, after the inspectors leave, there's gonna be hot plates and things on it with gas, okay, on this outer <laughs> side. And then the inside, there are benches, desks, and a table and closet. There's a Haitian, that, that little thing there is a Haitian uh, toilet that I can tell you about. It turns whatever you do into compost in three days. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's worth the lecture in itself. Next. And there's a bed in a closet, like it's eight by eight by eight and it's better than a yacht. By the way, all these shelves are the braces that make the plywood viable. Plywood is great because of the bracing. Right. It's, it's what all the boat builders know. It'll stiffen it up. It's really stiffened it. Yeah. Next. Can I take you to left field for a second? Go ahead. The concept of transportation as a service, mm -hmm. where we don't each have cars, yeah. is many years away. Yeah. But should that concept be in our long term planning, say, the calculus of the places that we're designing? that evolved to create more without more land? Well, I would say that, why don't you show the, you don't have the little house we did today. Do you? Uh, Listen, the key to this is make sure the garages are convertible. Uh, we have to build them now because we can't even get an appraiser to look at something. If it's not, uh, if the, no, not that one though, the other one. Uh, you can't do that, um, you, you can't, uh, First of all, I think bicycles are really the future. But for example, this is a little house, which is, it's a, it's a house that's on a 50 by 100 foot lot that begins as a one or two bedroom house, a little courtyard, a little courtyard building. And then it also comes with potential garages in front. I'll show you that later. They can convert to various things there. You can also build on the roof and build behind. So what starts as a two bedroom house can, can actually end up as a 10 bedroom house, 10 bedroom with, and, and four different units just by scabbing onto it, okay? Now, what is this mentality? That's what the world does. That is what the world all over the world, that's what the peasants in Italy do, that's what the peasants in China do, that's what the peasants right now, and the poor people everywhere in the world, this is how they build, you see? now except the bedrooms in this case are full of bathrooms and they're full of insulation and, and they have queen size beds, that's the difference. But the basic notion that you can build a seed building that is durable enough to build on top, in front of and behind is the kind of thing that is, and of course the main thing is the garage. The garage is the first move towards creating a compound, but so is the flat roof. Those are flat roof. Yeah. 
So you build, you see that courtyard, you build that. See the wall, there's very little building that goes on there. Now, if you, you can, by the way, you this complies with all, that 10 bedroom house with God knows how many bathrooms is within a 50 by 100 foot lot complying with all the setbacks. So I'm working with an existing, I'm breaking lots of rules, but not some rules. I'm not breaking every rule. This is a 50 by 100. Okay, you wanna live in a house in a 50 by 100 foot lot? Fine, go ahead and do that. But this has killer density. This says, I don't know, this has 20 beds. This sleeps 20. And it sleeps 20 in subsections of, uh, of dwellings. There's incredible, incredible, uh, do you have the, the, the modules? The mo we just did this morning. Uh, there, the modules we did this morning. You see what's happening? Here's the core, but you can keep adding, adding and adding and adding with lots of different variations. So you can actually design your own dwelling as you need it, but it's not your own dwelling. The problem is you can't do anything with your dwelling. Your dwelling is, is, is dead. What you want to design is a compound. That's the concept. Something so that, much more complex. Does that force you to put new ingredients into the form-based code? I think this could, this actually meets the code, except for the parking in front. Andreas, going back to the compound, Diru asked earlier, what what like, give us a sense of either spatial or the number of people. We know what a neighborhood is. We know what a city is. So, okay. like, that what compound, is the compound? Okay, I'm going to show you two compounds. That compound I showed you is 50 by 100 foot lot. Um, so that's one one increment. Here's another one. Yeah, this compound is actually for uh, for um, Carlton Landing. No, not that one. The the compound of the BMW. Okay, so let me let me show you something. Have you ever? I don't know whether you've bought a car lately, but they take you through a decision tree that's very impressive. Let's say you go to the BMW dealer. The guy says, "What body type do you want? Do you want a sports car, two seater? Do you want a sedan, or do you want an SUV?" And then you say, "I want a sedan." Okay. Then the next thing comes up and says, okay, so we have, we have a series of sedans, the two series, three series, four, five, six, and seven series, and they have multiple doors and different sizes. So let us say you choose a three series, okay? Then they take you, that's the chassis. Then they take you and say, what engine do you want? Do you want a 2.0 liter or 2.8 liter or, you know, 2.8 liter diesel or 3.5 liter? Okay, and then they say, okay, by the way, what they tell you, is let me, let's build your own car. Let's build the car for you. Right, right. Let's build your car. So that's cool. So then you go in and you say, what this guy has actually chosen is a 325, okay? And then they say, well, it's $48,000. Oh, because all of these have their prices. And they say, well, that's too much or too little. And then you can go back and adjust the price, okay? But that's, that's and then finally you get the package, which is the aesthetic. Notice that all we do normally is give them the package. Do you want the bedroom on the left? Do you want the bedroom upstairs? Do you want the kitchen, you know, facing the backyards or the front yards? We just give them the, the pack, the, 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 we give them the, the aesthetics. We don't give them real choice. You can do this in a compound very easily as well as a house. So this is a choice. This is a compound done for Carlton Landing in which we have the main building. We have additional buildings. And then we have uh, isolation spaces, garages, and, and, and shared pavilions. I, I, could, I'm not, I don't have time to go into what each of them are. Some of them are, are innovative, but, next, but they're, they're substantially different. Okay, some of them are just, they just pack bedrooms, additional bedrooms. Some of them are sub-dwellings. Some of these are places where you work. Some of them are places where you hide. Some of them are workshops, okay? But you go through the decision tree, go. Okay, so you say, what, what main house do you want? Next. Okay, and you choose that. Then you say, which, uh, which ancillary dwellings do you want? Show the next, next. Okay, so that's the four that are available. Next. You choose two. Next. Okay, then how, what of these additional buildings? You want a common larder, which is where the groceries are shared. Do you want offices uh, that are separate? And then what kind of garage do you want? Bearing in mind, the garages are also workshops. And then finally, you can have an outdoor pavilion for exercise. Remember exercise is best outdoors now and a pool. So you choose your BMW, then you assemble it. You see, and here it is assembled into a compound. So that's one increment. So that when it, this has the dwelling, it has the compound, and then there's the cluster. That, that space in the middle is a cluster space in the middle. 
And by the way, there's, there are different levels of governance and taxation and so forth. And uh, so uh, anyway, that seems to be going ahead. Because by the way, uh, you know, Carlton Landing that is two and a half hours away from Oklahoma City, it's, it's just going off the, the sales are unbelievable, you know, because people are, are trying to get away. But they're not landing right. They're, they're landing just in single family houses when actually they could reassemble their society if they wish. So Grant Humphreys and his group are taking a longer view here, trying to consider this as a possibility. I think so. And uh, before I go, I really want to show you what I think the house of the future is, uh, which we designed for, for Alice Beach, because Alice is also thinking about the future. It's the same. Uh, could you show the, the compound house? This has a lot of ingredients. No, the, the, the Alice house that has a compound. So for Alice, we designed a COVID apartment building, a COVID house, and a COVID, uh, and a COVID uh, live work unit. Okay, so this is the COVID house. Okay, so in a 50 foot lot, notice the following, that the garages are much wider. They're not just the minimum for a car. They're actually really good spaces for other things. Notice they're split so you can convert one and not the other, okay? Notice that there's a place outside a terrace where you can meet people without letting them in to the house. By the way, that doesn't seem, but it is cross ventilated. Okay, notice that there's a cleanup room. That room has a sink, which we know about, but it also has a UV light, okay, to detoxify everything, very cheap to do. But you basically take, that's a mud room, but it's a mud room that, has, that is full of sanitizers and UV light. Then you enter the dwelling, okay? Pretty normal kitchen on the right, except the workstations. What I find is that people are working like crazy in the kitchen and their computers and the kitchens are not set up. I think the computer and the printer is one more appliance like an oven, okay? It's like an oven. You gotta give a, you can't have a printer. A printer is not negligible. You gotta design for it. And people are working in the kitchen because it's sociable. They're, 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 they're working on the booth. You know, like that, that's normal to do that. We just need to give them plugs. Then there's a living room that is actually living and dining, but it opens up drastically to courtyards on both sides, okay? So it's not a central courtyard because the central courtyard doesn't have sufficient cross ventilation. So when you open up these doors, there is no, this is where modernism comes in. There's no difference, none, zero difference between inside and out. So suddenly you have a living room that is 50 feet wide and it can have a pool or a garden. Now, as far as the bedrooms go, the bedrooms are actually studio apartments, full studio apartments, because you actually might be quarantined. You might be quarantined six times a year, Lou. Every time you go out and buy something in a grocery store, <laughs> okay, Lou, lock yourself up now. <laughs> so you gotta have, a, you gotta have, and notice how, how they're not unshared corridors. This is a Palladian plan. The bedrooms are not in shared corridors. They're totally different. They're, they're in the three or four corners of the house. Okay, so you don't have this psychology that you're sharing anything. You're isolated. You know, big, big closets, plenty of, time, of place to work, place to sit, et cetera. So these are like bed sitting rooms. Then you go upstairs and notice what's happening. Notice that the garage door is hermetic in the first floor. It's antisocial when it's closed. But when you go upstairs, next one, when you go upstairs, there's a double height of the living room, but you go upstairs and there's a big room, which is the multi-purpose room that can become your gym, your office, your school. And then there's a veranda on top. I believe that the sociability space, the one that gives life to the street is much more like New Orleans in which the veranda is on top. It's above the hubbub. You still socialize with the hubbub, but you're above it. And by the way, if things ever get tough, if there's social instability, you see this house is fantastically safe because it actually looks like a warehouse. And that's another thing. We have to rethink the aesthetic. Keep going, one more. <clears throat> okay, one thing about the aesthetic. Stop bragging, okay, about how rich you are with stupid ass McMansions because there are gonna be some poor people out there just like you that don't, are not living well. Okay, and even if they're not, not marauders that are coming to assault you, keep going. Even if they're not marauders coming to assault you, it's extremely obnoxious to show off wealth. And by the way, the amount of that kind of shit that's going on in new urbanism and in suburbia is really, I think, actually extremely insensitive. 
Okay, so this is how the houses are. They pack really tightly. The presentation to the street is much more like a warehouse district than a residential one. Show the, show the next. You see, it's much more like a warehouse district. It doesn't have all the, and by the way, garage doors, we should become experts. They're beautiful garage doors now that are actually good for cars, but also good as shops and good as offices. Okay, so you see, you see how we're beginning to actually deal with an aesthetic change as well, that, uh, yeah, we have to sober up. One of the things people don't realize that when you go to difficult places where there's social instability, like in, all over the Mediterranean and Latin America, the wealth is indoors. The presentation to the street is extremely austere. Okay, you're always surprised when you enter a courtyard house in Seville or in, or in Cartagena, Colombia, that you, you enter a, a nondescript, relatively solid wall, then you go inside and it's a palace, it's a paradise. That is out, not just out of fear of assault, of marauders, it's actually out of, out of uh, consideration for people who don't have the wealth at all. So you're not gonna stick it in their eye the way that the, McMahon, the American McMansion does. And for that matter, by the way, I think classicism has a very limited shelf life, extremely limited. Because not only is it braggy, but it's also associated with white male oppression for like 3000 years. So, you know, I'm just telling this to the ICA, like just, you know, bear this in mind, you're gonna be, you're gonna be uh, terminated. Uh, it's also Andres, expensive talk, to maintain, you know. Yeah, Andreas, talk to us about the blank wall. I mean, that the, the public realm is this active area. And so you've done it well with the garages and then the verandas on, on either side, but the, the view that we're looking at right here is just a blank wall. Talk to on us the about side, that. On the side, the on the side, right? Outside, if you're walking on the sidewalk, right there. Okay. See? Okay. Yeah. That is, there's a, there's a non-American look. My own house is like this where I'm looking at, in which the courtyard has a decent wall to the street, but with windows, okay? This is not a windowless wall. If it's a windowless wall, then it's unsafe and extremely obnoxious. But it also, it's very careful to lend a tree to the street. It actually lends greenery to the street. The greenery doesn't, doesn't grow on the street because it just gets trashed out there because no one cares for it. So basically the trees are inside the courtyard and they lean out and they provide a great deal of green. By the way, this goes for China as well. I mean, it's, it's quite cross-cultural, this type. It's just not an American type. It could also be green walls, I think too, right? If you had the also, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you also have to be careful because the setbacks are short and to have a lot of windows, you, uh, First of all, assume it's not gonna be maintained, okay? Because there's no money for that, for maintaining the public realm that's green. Put it inside, unless it's palms, palms do okay. But also the windows are a problem. Notice how small the windows are on the first floor. Oh, and the flat roofs, don't be afraid of flat roofs. They're for solar, solar, et cetera. We should solicit a few more questions out there for those who have them that haven't posted them on the Q and A. Here's, here's a good one, uh, Andreas. What about uh, at the micro scale, for example, re the regional level, level, is the transect needed? Any modifications to be as useful as it was before the, before the pandemic? If yes, from which type they might be. So how might we modify the, the regional aspects of the transect? Okay, first, uh, this, I haven't thought about the transect for pandemic, but Liz, her, her course on adaptation and how you respond uh, is definitely transect base. Okay, you don't respond to flooding the same way in the city as you do in the suburbs or any of the aspects of it. You don't expect a tall building to be uh, solar self-sufficient because it doesn't have enough. It doesn't have enough roof, you know, for the solar collectors. But you can expect a, a single-family house to have enough roof and, in fact, to uh, to do its own recycling. And and then even you know what I mean. So the transit has been worked out for adaptation. I haven't started with this, but, but Lynn, you know that in terms of the region, uh, we're working with uh, Scott uh, Bernstein mm -hmm. on, when you look at the maps of America, okay, you will see marked out the places that will flood, the places that, have, that, will, that will burn. You, you, what you'll see marked out are the following, uh, of, uh, flood, 
fire, wind, and drought. Okay, that's what's coming. It's the four horsemen of the of the of the of climate change. And so when you map them all together, what's left is a huge part of America that is not subject to heat and all these things, right? It's, it's actually, there are places that are gonna be very vis viable, I'm not gonna say for centuries, but a hell of a, a longer than the Florida coast, including by the way, in Florida. You know, we have a ridge down the middle that is at uh, plus, I don't know how many feet. I myself live at plus 16. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna be receiving areas. So the first act, it should be a regional, regional planning at the national or at least the state level. We've received a commission uh, after Hurricane, uh, uh, the last one, uh, Zeta, I think it was, that hit Lake Charles uh, in Louisiana. And we're, we're tr I think we're gonna map, I don't believe the entire state is, is subject to flooding, but the first thing we're gonna map are places where people should move to so they don't get flooded again. And you know, FEMA, FEMA actually is policy, FEMA wants you to move. You know, FEMA wants you to move away from trouble and somehow the new urbanists have gotten it through their head that it's dishonorable to leave as if we had the power to prevent people from leaving cities. I have seen it, I don't know how many hurricanes I've seen. When a hurricane hits Miami, people move to Fort Lauderdale. They don't hang around for reconstruction, they just move on. To a, to a fungible place. Unfortunately, they land in suburbia. So one of the things that I'm very concerned about is that the new urbanism have protocols for the receiving areas so that when people leave, not if people leave, but when they leave, they don't, add, they don't land in suburban sprawl, that they have a choice. Is there, is there an outdoor terrace on this thing that we're looking at now? Sort of uh, no, uh, there's a there's a roof terrace. A roof terrace. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. One of the choices is we can give you an unroofed terrace on the street or on the side, right? Yes. Yeah, you price. see it. That's below. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's below. But listen, what I was experimenting with this, I was experimenting with a very thick, with a very thick aesthetic. Okay. That is a thick brick, uh, concrete block wall. Notice how we set the the garage doors back. Yeah. Okay. Don't mess with this. Okay. Go riot somewhere else. Sorry. And then, of course, it's all metal. That's a metal armature. It's not wood. It's metal. It's fireproof. It's, in fact, you can bang it with your crowbar. Nothing's going to happen to this. OK, am I being pessimistic? Really? I used to say that before the riots. OK, before the riots, I would say, we better be careful because this is how it ends. OK, and now we've had permanent riots in I don't know how many places. Well, yeah. OK, we don't have to. We, it's not in our power to stop the riots. OK, that's at a different level. But it is, for example, in our power to make places that actually won't get trashed. And I, you know, unfortunately, by the way, the, this riot stuff, you know what it's going to do? It's going to drive people back to the malls, store owners. It's going to drive people to inward retail, inward facing retails so they can lock the doors. That's another problem with one of our premises about Main Street. And you know what happened to the Louisville we loved at, at two CNUs ago? What happened to that street? That was 20 years work, it got trashed. Mm -hmm. So, and the, unfortunately, I think that our crowd hides from that. They can't face it, you know, what's going on now. And, and I think the whole ethos of CNU is to be realistic and face the reality and come up with the best possible solutions. And it ain't gonna be wooden porches with you know, with with uh, with classical trim, it, that's over. I think on the retail side, it could be a lot more pop-ups. It's pretty yeah. amazing the amount of that stuff that's going on now because of the opportunity for location. Yes, yes, yeah. trucks and pop-ups, exactly. Yeah, we need to study that. By the way, we're closer to a shanty town than to an uh, to a to a. <laughs> okay, let me just say we're not closer. We just need new DNA. I would just love to hear what a successful shanty town is in Santo Domingo as opposed to an unsuccessful shanty town. They both exist. Okay. Get somebody and say, listen, this one does really well and this one didn't. Well, tell me why. There is DNA there. To be researched. Sounds like an academic project. Yeah. All right. We're going to try to wrap up by 115. 
Um, so Lou, uh, any, any final questions for Andreas? And Andreas, do you have any final comments that you want to make? Well, I can go. My, my first question is really, and it doesn't have to be answered now, Andreas, but yeah. I think this there has to be consideration to the northern half of the country because mm -hmm. it's cold and yeah. you've got to deal with it. A lot, a lot of fresh air is great, but climate, I mean, years ago when we were at CNU in Buffalo, I said we ought to be given a $2,000 tax credit to young people on the first year and $1,000 a year after that to buy the right clothes to live in Buffalo. Because they, we've got everything we need in Buffalo. Yeah. You, could, you could make a whole new city out of it with existing infrastructure, utilities, everything that's there. Yeah. It's just a little chilly if you learn to live with it. Do you know, there's something that really disturbs some of my friends that actually, uh, I, there's quite a lot of things that I say that I don't know how to solve. I, you know, uh, I, I don't know what to do about that. And then they get really upset. Well, you better try harder. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I said, no, actually, it is really cold up there. And uh, what do you, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, remember one thing of the power. People moved south all over the world after the, la after the 1918 pandemic. They moved to the desert. They moved to, I mean, you know, LA in 1918 was nowhere. There was nothing happening in LA. Six years later, that was Hollywood. It was the center of everything. And they moved down not only from the east, but from San Francisco. People were moving south all the time, all the time, all the time. And so I, sometimes, I somehow feel a little powerless about that. Um, you know, what can I do? I don't know how to do outdoor life, you know. Well, but, you know, but the thing is, there's so many really good examples from which we can draw. You know, the Twin Cities has an incredibly robust outdoor life, um, and they have learned to live with the cold. The same when we look at the Scandinavian countries, when we look at Siberia and Russia and these other places, there are a lot of examples globally where mm -hmm. you have an active public realm and active public. Yeah. And it's not that your designs that you just showed would need to modify much, but it's rethinking how do we <laughs> accommodate. You don't go anywhere in Copenhagen in the wintertime where restaurants don't have blankets to give you while you sit outside and you're just, you know, you're being outside. So it's thinking about how we want to engage and live with the different climates. Well, so, I, I think I actually one thing I do that is stimulating this challenge. Okay. I accept, I accept that it's a challenge. I do know that there you can do a lot with awnings in front of, you know, in, in terms of keeping the basic wind out. But I think the great invention is the garage door. You know, that, that those, uh, those wonderful looking aluminum garage doors, you know, that are double pane. Right, roll up. You know. And the roll up doors, that kind of thing, yeah. which I don't think I've never seen a new urbanist actually take a good look at them or present them anywhere. But perhaps that is that what, you know, something you can close it open on a daily basis. Cause you know, there are good winter days. As let, well. me, let me throw out a crazy idea. This is completely from left field. I built an amusement park, which was a safari park, and I built an elephant barn where we heated the floor because the elephant stayed warm by, by standing on a hot floor, right. warm floor. Yeah. So what if we took our outdoor pavilions that we have and did geothermal underneath the asphalt right. and then put a gas unit outside the building, taking fresh air and passing it through the building and exiting out of the building in a way so that you move fresh air through, you're not fighting against cold ground. And therein, if you're bundled like Amsterdam, maybe with a blanket, those kind of things, you find a way to do both, but you have to bring a different perspective to it of mm -hmm. ingredients that make it habitable. Well, okay. Now, Lou's right. There's going to be people aren't going to move south after this pandemic, mostly because, uh, you know, of, of climate changes, the expense, et cetera. But as you and I've talked before, there is a whole host of incredible cities yeah. you know, in the former. I Russia. think they're going to move north, actually. That's where they're going to move. So these questions about how do we modify some of these designs? Okay. I cannot. People are going to be wanting half a second, but wanting the sun. Folks are going to want to be outside. So how can we adopt the designs to encourage a more outside life? Well, the first thing we have to do is throw the bums out that prevent us from doing it. Okay. You know, when I, when we were doing the master plan for Naples, the fire marshal, I said, why aren't there cafe tables in Naples with under awnings? And they said, because the fire marshal wants us to sprinkler them. Okay. Just to begin with. 
Okay, that's, you know, so we got rid of that. If this, if we, to do your idea, Lou, we have to meet lead standards instead of Granger. By the way, if you go to the Granger catalog right now, the farmer's catalog, you better believe they have under, under concrete pipes and fans, you know, that do like that slow. Okay, now you let lead get their paws on this idea and suddenly it costs a hundred times more. Because you got the filter the air. We have to have some kind of pilot, constant ongoing pilot project where we can try things without changing the whole damn system. And that's where I actually love the rioters because what they're talking about is direct action. We're just going to do the damn thing. Okay. You know, that's a word that has future, direct action. And I think that the young generation, the 20, 20 year olds, what they're doing is direct action. They're bypassing all the naysayers. And by the way, I consider lead to be one of the great ogres of innovation. Lynn, that's an interesting idea of trying to get some legislative support for demonstration projects. Exactly. Everybody fears the unknown, yeah. but if there's a way to package it, that it's a demonstration, now we can, if you would analyze the known and decide what's good and bad about making it achievable. But if we sit back and wait until it's perfect on paper and academically and socially and agency wise no. No. approved, <laughs> the idea will be dead before we build it. You know? well, we, should, uh, we should talk to the farmers in Nebraska that have cow, cow sheds. I mean, they probably know everything we need to know. <laughs> yeah, I think in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And so again, I think right. that cities are really going to be looking at how do we create more functional out spot, outside spaces. And we're already seeing it with the number of streets that have been opened up to pedestrian only activity. Now as the, as the Northern or, or Midwestern states move into more of the colder season, we're still gonna see that innovation. So- um, But you know, you know in, in France, they ban, the Greens banned the heaters, the outdoor heaters. You know, the ones that already were in cafes because the French really, they keep using the sidewalks in winter they just banned, you know, these kind of pyramidal things that give heat? Yeah. The ones that hang above, they were just banned this year. I mean, really, we're all just working so completely. So many things are working against a traditional city that it's amazing. And we, I think that CNU can line things up, can coordinate. No, no, you green guys, let us have, this is not the same. Like actually having a heater here is a good thing. Go after somebody else, you know, not us. Yeah, Andreas, you make a really good point. There, there is, uh, and as you and I've been talking over the last several months, there's an incredible opportunity here for the new urbanist movement to continue to innovate and to define the edge. That is, that yeah. is our call to action, that yeah. we have the skills, the problem solving, the innovations to right. think about, not only to react to yeah. what's happening now, but to go, to go a few years out. And that's why I was asking about what are the actions that we can take now in this short, medium, and, and long term. So- um, The new, new urbanism began by uh, quite friendless because we were continually stepping on people's toes. Look, if we're going to end, uh, there's, an, there's a, a myth that I, uh, that uh, Douglas, my brother Douglas actually uh, told me that actually keeps me going. And he said this, I was complaining one day about how my whole life I felt like Sisyphus. In fact, I had a, a baseball hat that said Sisyphus on. And because I would roll something uphill and then would roll down again, roll up. I said, Douglas, I feel like Sisyphus. This is terrible. It says, oh my God, Douglas, my brother says, you misunderstand that myth. You don't realize that Sisyphus chose his fate, you know? And he said, do you know what he's being punished for? He was just punished. He was being punished for insulting the gods. All he had to do was stop insulting the gods and the stone would stay uphill. The thing about the new urbanism is that we insult the gods, right? We go after the ITE, we go after the traffic engineers, we go after the ULI. We insulted everybody on earth to get the first generation of new urbanism built. Okay, that's how we did it. We were absolutely friendless and isolated. And what's happened in the last 10 years, we wanna be everybody's friend, okay? No, I'm totally against actually making, you know, uh, joining other organizations because it means we have to play nice. We don't play nice, okay? We, that's not our ethos. We bust ass as necessary. 
Okay, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't work within the rules. And we, we didn't at the beginning, and that's why the new urbanism is a tiny elite movement instead of a big slobby one that loved by everybody. <laughs> well, on that, we're going to uh, absolutely thank Andreas. I, I, I always love talking to you, even if I don't always agree with you. Um, uh, and Lou, you did, you did a fabulous job uh, moderating. Um, a lot of questions were asked, uh, both in the chat and in the Q&A. We tried to get as many as we could. Um, this entire webinar will be posted on our website within uh, 24 hours. And again, uh, please join us next week for our, our, the brand new Authors Forum on Architecture and the City with Michael Dennis and interviewer Dan Solomon. So, and, and um, for those of by you- By the way, send me the questions and I might even answer them actually. Right and join CNU. Yeah. You've got to Absolutely. keep a foundation on which we build these ideas, okay? Absolutely. And keep spreading. It's not only building, but spreading the ideas. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so come um, on and come early. We need the support yeah. now in the pandemic, all right? Yeah. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Andreas. Big hugs Bye. all around. And thank you everyone for joining. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.